Good morning, everyone. <laughs> nice to see you all. And uh, it's, um, I don't know, it's great to be able to be a teacher of the Dhamma because the Dhamma is such a powerful and beautiful teaching. Yeah. It never ceases to amaze me how powerful these teachings are and how they have the ability to transform our lives so, and to make such a massive difference, not only for ourselves, uh, but also for the world that we live in here. And uh, so it is a great privilege uh, to be able to be here, to have a short retreat, and it's wonderful to see this new story, uh, yeah, this new kind of level up here. Uh, it's a marvelous addition to the BGF. This is what happens when you have the Dhamma, yeah, people become generous, they give, and you can build these beautiful facilities for these teachings, which is great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about the idea of uh, liberation today. Uh, and of course the idea of liberation is one of the very many beautiful ideas in Buddhism. Yeah, do you, would you like to be liberated? Or would you prefer to be in prison? This is your choice, right? So we can choose prison or we can choose liberation. And it's kind of obvious what we want. No one wants to be in prison. Because in prison means that you are limited, you cannot really do what you want. You're held back by the guards, they restrain you. You try to dig that tunnel underneath, and the guards say, no, cannot dig that tunnel, right? Uh, but our job is to dig that tunnel. Uh, you know, the Noble Eightfold Path is the tunnel out of the prison. Uh, yeah? So please dig that tunnel. Uh, I was saying the other day that um, one of the nice, one of the things that we need to do as Buddhists, uh, we need to make sure that we are not the white sheep. Because the white sheep are always the ones that follow along, yeah? And when the leadership goes to the cliff, everyone goes over the cliff. So, so our job is to be the black sheep. Yeah? The black sheep is the one that turns around, that doesn't go over the cliff. The black sheep is the sheep that thinks for itself and goes a different direction. Only when you think for yourself, only when you go in a different direction, is it possible to find what we call all these positive things on the Buddhist path, including freedom itself liberation, freedom from all the troubles of the world, uh, and all of these kind of things. Uh. So freedom is a very beautiful word, uh, and I think it is very important to understand what freedom actually means in Buddhism, uh, because it has a very different meaning in Buddhism than it has in ordinary life. Yeah, Ordinary life, freedom has a very limited kind of meaning. Uh. And when I was in the U.S. recently, not, yeah, he said Europe, uh, Bobby, but actually it's the U.S. I was. And anyway, it doesn't matter, Europe, U.S., all the same, right? <laughs> Somewhere overseas, I don't, I don't know. So uh, I was in, uh, in the U.S., and one of the nice things about traveling overseas uh, is that you, when I go overseas, I usually ask, well, what do you want to hear about? Uh, and so I, I, I wrote to Bobby, where's Bobby? He's always working really hard, running around the back. That's at the back, okay. Don't, so now you can relax, Bobby. It's good to see that. So I, I wrote to Bobby and I said, well, what do you want to hear about in, in, in KL? What is kind of the topic that is used for KL? He said, hi, ah, whatever you want to talk about. <laughs> That's what he said to me. And so I said, okay, I'll talk about the same thing I talked about in the U.S. Because when you travel overseas, it's actually nice to hear what the local people want to hear about. So don't be shy about telling me what you want to hear. Yeah, Please give any, any kind of topic is okay. It's more interesting for me. Otherwise, I talk about the same old thing every time. Those people who go on my retreats, they know every time, every exactly the same things, right? Whoa, so boring after a while. So please come up with some new topics. And when I was in the U.S., I was traveling all over the U.S., starting on the West Coast in the San Francisco area, and then traveling across the continent. Uh, I went to Minneapolis, then to Chicago, then to New York, and then to Boston, uh, yeah, all kind of all across the continent. Uh, and when I was in uh, uh, Minneapolis, uh, well, first of all, it was minus 26 degrees. Uh, yeah, minus 26. I was wearing my sandals, no socks, right? Uh, whoa, that was very interesting. Uh, but that wasn't the main point. The main point, I asked them what they wanted to hear about in Minneapolis. And I said what they wanted to hear about was the idea of constitutional freedoms versus Buddhist freedom. Now, the American idea of constitutional freedom are the freedoms that are laid down in the American Constitution. Yeah, And they have this idea that you have the right to bear arms. Is that a freedom? I, I, some, I think sometimes Americans have a very different idea of freedom than most other people. For me, that is not a freedom. It's scary. Everyone carrying guns. I mean, that kind of is the opposite of freedom to my mind. But anyway, they, they have to do what they want in the U.S. So. 
Sometimes people have weird ideas. Uh, yeah, so that freedom of, to bear arms, freedom to assemble, freedom of speech, yeah, these kind of things are the things that are the core of the American Constitution. Uh, and so uh, the question then is, well, uh, you know, how does that compare with a Buddhist idea of freedom? Uh, yeah, and this is actually very interesting. Yeah, because one of the things that you find once you start to compare the worldly kind of freedom to the Buddhist kind of freedom, uh, you start to understand that actually the worldly freedoms uh, are very shallow kind of freedoms. Uh, they don't go very far. Uh. One of the things that you see in the American Constitution, there's what they call the preamble to the American Constitution. The preamble is like the introduction to the American Constitution. Uh, and you've probably heard about this. It says there in the beginning that uh, everyone has the right to um, uh, what, what is it? The, it has the right to life, liberty, uh, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, yeah, you heard that phrase, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Uh, there were some nice commercials, I remember. When I grew up, there were some commercials on TV, and it was life, liberty, and Wrangler jeans. Uh, <laughs> the pursuit of happiness, right? Wrangler jeans was the pursuit of happiness. Yes, I remember, it's like, I never forgot that kind of statement from the American Constitution after seeing those commercials. This is how commercials condition you, yeah? Don't think that you can withstand the commercials. You get conditioned by them. Huh? So I saw, I, I looked at this, okay, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It sounds good, right? Okay, who doesn't want the pursuit of happiness? Who doesn't want liberty? Yeah, who doesn't want life? If someone says, I'm going to kill you, you say, no, thank you very much, I'm happy to be alive. Yeah, life is good, uh, usually for most people. Uh, but there is a problem with this. Uh, if you look at this carefully, uh, because it says the pursuit of happiness, uh, right? Liberty, well, liberty helps you to pursue happiness. Uh, but the pursuit of happiness, uh, there's an assumption in there that is actually very important to understand. Uh, and that assumption is that we know what happiness is. Uh, right? How can you pursue happiness uh, if you don't know what happiness is? Uh? So the question is, well, do people know what happiness is? And the answer, of course, is no. We don't know what happiness is. Uh, because we don't know. People do all kind of crazy things in the world in the pursuit of happiness. Uh, but actually, they don't find it. If you look at the average person in society, whatever society you go to, they go through their lives, they do all of these kind of things, but they don't usually find any real contentment, satisfaction, happiness in their life. So we don't know where to find happiness. So the pursuit of happiness is kind of empty if you don't know where happiness is, right? What is the point of pursuing happiness if you don't know what it is? For most people, the idea of the pursuit of happiness is, yeah, you go out, this is like the Wild West in the US, you go out, you get yourself a property, you kind of, you build up a farm or something, and you kind of, like the little house on the prairie. Have you seen, seen that? Yeah, no, yeah, okay, that's kind of a famous TV series. When I grew up, this was really big on TV, right? And you kind of, you do something, you build up a family and this kind of things, and you pursue happiness. But actually, it's just really hard work, yeah? and the kind of happiness you get is often very shallow. It isn't very profound at all, uh, because you don't know where to look for it. Uh, the pursuit of happiness is about building up a big bank account. Uh, the pursuit of happiness is owning a big car. Just coming back from the U.S., the cars they have are enormous over there. In Malaysia, the cars are tiny compared to the U.S. You have no idea <laughs> this enormous kind of things, right? Uh, that is the idea of happiness. Uh, and it's very shallow. It doesn't actually go very where, go, go very far. And so I said to this crowd in Minneapolis, I said to them, well, you know, we should add something to the American Constitution. This is what happens when you're an arrogant monk. You go to the US, yeah, your Constitution is not good enough. I'm going to tell you how to add to the American Constitution. <laughs> this kind of monks, they're kind of too, too conceited. But anyway, so I said, what we should do, we should add some Buddhist ideas into the Constitution, because the Buddhist ideas will show you where to find happiness, yeah? No point in having pursuit of happiness unless you know where to find it. Uh, so we'll add some, I'll give you some nice Buddhist uh, kind of suttas, and you whack those into your Constitution. Uh, and I looked at the crowd, and they started laughing. <laughs> they thought, this was, this is not going to work, we're not going to have any Buddhist uh, suttas in the American Constitution. But I think it's actually a very important idea, because without that understanding, actually, there's no way that we can pursue that happiness. So we should really add those Buddhist suttas. In fact, I think that we should have the Buddhist suttas should be maybe form the constitution of all our countries, right? Uh, why? Because then we actually have countries that are governed by real understanding of the nature of the world and how things are. Then maybe there is a hope that actually we're going to 
really find something worthwhile in this life. Uh, so uh, this was my starting point, uh, this idea that uh, we don't really understand where happiness is to be found. So I'm going to talk about that today. Where is real freedom to be found? Uh, and the liberty to pursue your happiness only has meaning insofar as we understand where happiness is and where suffering is. Uh, now one of the, of course, one of the strange things is that in our modern world we are often quite conceited. Uh, we're quite hubristic. Yeah. We think that we are the pinnacle of civilization. Uh, that all the cultures that came before us are kind of, uh, you know, lower and lesser, they're not the same. Uh, and in the US, everyone, yeah, we are the land of the free, right? It's kind of the American idea. They are the, they are kind of the, this is where the freedom really is to be found. Uh, and it's kind of weird because when you look at, uh, there's all kind of international statistics about the freest countries in the world. And America is nowhere near the top. It's like maybe down number 20 or something like that. But everyone in the U.S. thinks that this is the land of the free. Actually, no, it's not really true. And one of the fascinating things to me is that if you look at ancient India, have many of you been to India? Yeah, some of you are nodding your head. Many of you, yeah, okay, cool, great, okay. So welcome to the club. A good, it's a nice, very nice thing to do to have go to India. Have you been to India anywhere? Huh? No. Whoa. Okay. This is your chance. Next time. Next time. Next time. We'll have. <laughs> so, uh, because going to India is very fascinating. One of the, you know, when you read the suttas, uh, uh, it is like a story almost. You read about the Buddha. He was in Rajagaha. He met King Bimbisara, and it sounds like a fairy tale story. Huh? You wonder, is this real? Is this just a story? Is it like kind of the, uh, I don't know, Thousand and One Nights or like the Brother Grimm's fairy tales? I don't know. What other kind of Chinese fairy tales? Do you have fairy tales in Chinese, huh? in Chinese culture? Huh? Yeah, probably. Okay. Or probably most cultures have, have fairy tales. Uh, um, and so, yes, it's, you're not sure. Are these fairy, are these ancient Indian fairy tales? Did these people really exist? Uh, it's kind of hard to make it out, right? Uh, and so you, one of the beautiful things about going overseas and going to India, and seeing India is that you enter the suttas in an entirely new way. It's actually very, very powerful there. And I find it very interesting when I've been to India quite a few times. Uh, and these days, last time I went there, it was so much suffering. I'm not sure if I'm going to go back, but I, India, I have a love hate relationship with India because I love the suttas and I love to see the places where the Buddha was. Uh, but sometimes it can be that the country is also quite, uh, it's a different kettle of fish, India, yeah, to most other countries. Uh, so it's kind of, uh, go there in the middle of winter when I was there, it was really cold. Everyone was burning fires. They couldn't breathe. They couldn't breathe for 10 days. It was, really, <laughs> it was a lot of dukkha and they kind of coughing and all the time. You can see why people die young in some of these places. Uh. But what is wonderful about going to India is that when you go there, uh, and you see the places, what you see here is like you enter the suttas. Uh, because the things that are there today are the same as they were two and a half thousand years ago. Uh, yeah, when you go to Rajagaha, Rajagaha is the ancient capital of the Magadan em Empire. Uh, and in the suttas, Rajagaha has two names. They're called Rajagaha, which means like the hold of the king. Uh, it's a place that was held by the king, right? Uh, that's one name. The other one is called Giribhajja, and Giribhajja means a hill fort. Uh, yeah, fortress in the hill, in other words. And when you go there, you go to Rajagaha, you see the mountains on all sides, and then you see kind of the plain in the middle, the feeling that you are in a fort. Yeah, it kind of fits the description really, really well. And you see the names of the hills just like it was at that time. And then when you go to the foot, this is what was really extraordinary to me when I saw this. You go to the foot of one of these hills, it is described in the suttas that this is where the king would go to bathe because there was a hot spring there, right? And there's this nice story about the monks bathing and the king is waiting patiently. Yeah, it's kind of nice. The king is waiting for the monks to finish, right? The king doesn't say, get out of here. You, you, this is a kind of young whippersnapper monks anyway. Go monks. I'm the king for goodness sake. Yeah. No, the king waited. And then when all the monks were finished, the king went to bathe. Yeah, and then after he had bathed, it was too late. They had closed the gates of the city. So the king had to sleep outside of the city. He couldn't get back in. So those kings must have been very small-time kings, right? They didn't really have any uh, much power. They couldn't even get back into the city. And then he went to the Buddha, and he complained to the Buddha. And then the Buddha laid down the rule that monks can only bathe once a fortnight. 
So if I smell, you know why, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there are exceptions. The exception is if you're outside of the Ganges area, you can bathe once a fortnight. So we are, we are okay. So I can, when I'm in Malaysia, I can have a shower every day, yeah, which is good because it's so sticky and hot over here. So if I don't have a shower every day, I'm, I'm in trouble. So, but this is kind of the suttas, right? This is how you kind of, you enter the world of the Buddha right? and you go to this foot of the place where the king, where the monks were bathing to exactly the same spot. And lo and behold, the Indians are still bathing in exactly the same place two and a half thousand years later on. Isn't that kind of extraordinary? It's a bit more made up now. They have some nice tiles. It looks more like kind of a bath place. They probably didn't have tiles two and a half thousand years ago. I, my guess, uh, but it kind of has the same feeling about it. Uh, and that's kind of extraordinary when you do that. It's like, you, wow, this is true. And I had a number of experiences like that when I was in India. I go to Benares, Varanasi, and they want to sell you cloth. Uh, Benares was the cloth capital of India at the time of the Buddha. That's where the best cloth was. Uh, the Buddha had cloth from Kasi. Kasi is another name for Varanasi, Benares. Uh, you go there today, you see me as a monk, like, yeah, okay, sir, come this way. Yeah, we've got some really good cloth for you. Uh, I don't have any money, but you're a monk. All monks have money. Come this way. Yeah. No. <laughs> so you had, you know, so this is what, what happened there. Have, have you been to India, Venerable Punsuri? Yeah. Yes? Many times? Many, many times? Uh, okay. How many times? Uh? Five times. Uh, okay. That's probably more than me, actually. Okay. <laughs> and so this is the um, the Indian experience to travel around. And one of the nice things about being a Buddhist monk, uh, when you travel around, you can read the signs. Yeah, but if you know Pali language, uh, the modern Hindi is so close to Pali, you can understand most of the names around there as well. That's kind of cool, right? Good reason to learn Pali. <laughs> And so you travel, and so you enter the, wor the word of the Buddha in an entirely new way. Next time you read the suttas, you realize, actually, these are real historical events. These people existed. There probably was a King Bimbisara. There was a King Ajata Sattu. There was a King Pasenadi of Kosala. There was Rajagaha. There was Sabati. There were Kusinara. These places actually exist. Yeah, they exist in the suttas and they exist in the present day. And that makes the teachings come alive. The Buddha becomes a real person. One of the most powerful things about reading the suttas uh, is to remember that the Buddha is speaking to you when you're reading the suttas. Uh. He's a his real historical person uh, who has this idea of setting out the Dhamma big time for the future generations. Uh, and he sets in, in motion the wheel of the Dhamma. It means that he knows that he's teaching not just the audience in front of him, uh, but he's teaching all these future generations as well in all the different countries and everywhere around the world. Uh. So when these things come alive in this way, uh, you start to feel the Buddha is not talking just to the audience there, he's talking to you. Uh. That is very powerful, uh, because when you read the sutta, the Buddha is talking to you, it's like, you start shaking a little bit. Uh -huh. The Buddha is talking to me. Oh, oh, oh. It kind of, that's, that's awesome, right? The Buddha, the greatest spiritual genius in, human, in recorded human history, is talking to you, little me, little you. Uh. Yeah, we're just ordinary human beings, and here is this genius of all the greatest genius in world history, probably in my opinion. I think the Buddha is the greatest of the great. Uh, yeah, he is just awesome. He's also human, but he's also awesome, and he's talking to each one of us. Uh, this is how reading the suttas, traveling to India in this way, it opens up a different dimension to this whole thing. Yeah. So, Go, go to India. Now, what is fascinating about the India, this is, I'm doing big detours in the way I talk. You can imagine, I'm not really going in a straight line at all. Right? But I was talking about the idea that in, we think we are so hubristic and conceited about our modern world. Can you remember me saying that before? Yes, about 10 minutes ago now, but I said that a while ago. Huh? And, but you actually start to realize when you read the, sut read the suttas that uh, actually a lot of the way we think in the present day here, yeah, already existed two and a half thousand years ago, right? Take this idea of freedom. This talk is really about freedom. It's not about uh, going on pilgrimage to India. But uh, um, So take this idea of freedom, for example. Uh, now, Indian society had a very open discourse, uh, a very open expression and exchange of ideas. Uh, yeah, this was very much part of Indian society. Uh, and you read about the various samanas, the shramanas, these are the ascetics that went forth yeah, and practiced in the world. Uh, 
you read about them and you read the various kinds of ideas that they were teaching, the various ideas they had, uh, the uh, things that they expressed to the followers. Uh, and it's this kind of amazing array. Some of them are so weird and wonderful, these teachings. You wonder how did anyone come up with these kind of things, uh, right? Uh, I don't know if you have read some of these things, but if you read the suttas, you will come across these teachings by the six kind of uh, uh, leading uh, uh, heretical, not heretical is the wrong word, the leading kind of uh, leaders of these movements, they had these different kind of religions, and they had this kind of amazing teachings. Uh, but one of the teachings that they had in those days was the idea of materialism, Yeah, the idea that when you come to the end of your life, everything is finished. Uh, this is kind of a modern idea. Many modern people think like that. Oh, when you die, that's the end of it. Uh, yeah, you don't get reborn anywhere. You don't, you don't go, there's no God. And you just bang, end. Okay, that's it. Uh, and many people think that this is a modern idea that comes out of science or whatever. But no, this is an idea that existed in all human history here. Yeah, yeah it goes back to the time of the Buddha. The Buddha would also have been uh, heard about these kind of ideas. Uh, so these ideas were always there. Uh, and, uh, you know, you look at uh, the way that uh, ancient India was governed, uh, they had the democratic institutions in some of these places. Uh, the Sangha is governed through democratic and decentralized institutions, where each monastery is independent of the other ones. Uh, and so many of these ideas that we think are modern sometimes, uh, actually they are ancient. Uh, and I think these things have always been there in human history here. Uh. Yeah, they have always been part of us. Uh, nothing is really new under the sun, as the saying goes, uh, because these are come from the human mind. Uh, and the human mind is pretty much the same. Uh, sometimes we think that we are more evolved, but I mean, really, are we that much more evolved? Okay, you have an iPhone, big deal, right? It doesn't really make much difference. Uh, but in terms of ideas, uh, in terms of the way we uh, relate to the world, uh, in very large, to a very large extent, we are the same now as they were uh, two and a half thousand years ago. In many respects, we have maybe gone backwards. Eh? How many Buddhas are alive today? Eh? I hope you don't raise your hand. That would get me very concerned. <laughs> I get me very worried. Sometimes you see people who kind of think they are the Buddha, but that's kind of a bit dodgy, you know, so don't worry too much <laughs> about that. Eh? But all these ideas have always been there. And the reason why these ideas have always been part of human history is because these are natural expressions eh? of the human mind. Uh, the human mind, one of the most important things of the human mind is the sense of I, that we exist. Uh, and that sense of I leads to certain consequences. Uh, and one consequence of the feeling of I inside, it, of course, from a Buddhist point of view, the feeling of I is an illusion. Uh, but one of the consequences of that feeling of I is that we have ideas about the world. Uh, because the I wants solidity. Uh, the I wants to and manifest somehow. What is this I inside? Uh, and once we have this I inside, it leads to speculation about what happens after you die. What's going to happen to me when I die, right? Uh, and there's always two possibilities what's going to happen to you after you die. Either you're going to live on forever after. Uh, this is the idea of theistic religion, say, where you have a creator God, uh, you carry on afterwards, or you are annihilated when you die, you come to an end. Uh, and these are the two standard views that always go with humanity. They are part and parcel of the feeling of I exist inside, and therefore carries on in this particular way forever. So these are not modern ideas at all. These are ideas that are, um, are inherent, really, to the idea of being a human being. They have to exist in our societies. So the first thing we should do is get rid of our conceit. The American idea that we are the free, yeah? Get rid of that conceit straight away, because that is just an illusion. Uh, America is no more free or less free than any other country. It is just conditioned in a different way. Uh, it is conditioned to think you are the most free. That is all. But actually, in reality, even though you think you are more free, doesn't necessarily mean you are more free. Uh, so, what then is this idea of Buddhist freedom? Uh, freedom is to have a nice cup of ginger tea here. That's part of freedom. So I'm gonna, um, okay, so, what is the idea of freedom? Now, one of the uh, kind of the problems with the idea of freedom is that a lot of people think that freedom is to be able to do what you want. Uh, yeah, and you see this many times, you see when people are rebellious, uh, you see this maybe, you know, when people 
say, uh, you know, for example, things like laws and things like moral codes and all of these kind of things, uh, what they do, they hem us in, uh, they block us from actually being able to express our freedom. Uh, yeah, and so we should enjoy ourselves in the world. Uh, we should do whatever we like, because when we do what we like, when we follow our desires, when we have the freedom of desire, then somehow we are going to be able to feel free, yeah? Because the desires want to express themselves, and if we hold back our desires, uh, well, all we're doing is blocking our ability to be free, yeah? So express yourself. Uh, don't worry about five precepts. Five precepts is for losers. Uh, Actually, five precepts is for winners, right? That's kind of the wrong way of thinking it. Actually, Ajahn Brahm always praises losers. I'm not sure what I should say now. But uh, anyway, you know, <laughs> a, lo a losing winner, a winning loser. I'm not sure how that this works. So. But uh, so this is this idea that if we are able to express our desires, having the freedom of desire, then somehow we have freedom. Huh? But actually, this is a misunderstanding. Huh? It's a dramatic misunderstanding because if you express all the defilements that you have, express all the desires that you have, you're going to do many things that are bad, because we want many bad things. Do you want some bad things sometimes? No? You never want any bad things? Wow, that's pretty impressive. There's one person who never wants anything bad. Okay, you are, maybe you should give this talk, because you are probably very pure. You are pure as the snow. <laughs> that was very funny when it shook, I'm sure it shook your head for some other reason. But anyway. That's good. So everyone has desires we don't want to follow. Sometimes we don't want to talk about those desires because we, it's, so, it's too private. If I tell the world my desires, whoa, it's going to be so embarrassing. Okay, I better shut up about my real desires. So we keep those in private and then we close our eyes and I hope no one ever finds out about my desires. But actually, we should talk about our desires because we're all the same. We all have these desires, yeah? And if we are more open about it, everyone feels more free because we realize actually everyone is just like us. Sometimes you want to kill someone, right? Isn't that true? Sometimes you get so angry. Oh, I mean, it's just an idle thought, but I, I really would like to kill this person. You have some enough of them. There's some interesting, uh, uh, there's interesting uh, experiments done on this, uh, and uh, very, very common for human beings to think that they want to kill someone else. Yeah, so welcome to the club if you had that thought. Uh, yeah, you're just kind of part of everyone else. We all had these ideas of doing bad things in life, uh, and of course it's just an idle thought. I'm not thinking that you would actually do it, uh, but sometimes the thought arises. Uh, and but if you follow all of the, those desires. Uh, what happens uh, is that your mind starts to become a very uncomfortable place. Uh, you start to feel bad about yourself. Uh, you start to have all kinds of regrets and remorse. Uh, you start to lose your self-esteem. You lose your sense of self-worth. Uh, you start to feel like a person who is worthless in this world uh, because you are living a life which really is worthless in many ways. Uh, yeah, so following your desires all the time is a recipe for disaster. Uh, it is a recipe for the opposite of freedom. You get the anti-freedom, you get imprisoned by all of these feelings inside that actually are very uncomfortable. You do one bad thing in your life, and you, you regret that one thing, and you are imprisoned by that one bad thing. So there's no freedom at all in doing all the bad things, right? It's the imprisonment that happens when you do all, all of these bad things. So freedom actually exists in being kind. If you live a life of kindness, uh, and we don't have to ca call it five precepts or eight precepts or 227 precepts or 1,837,000 precepts. You know that one? You know those precepts? Uh, no? If you add all the small rules in the suttas, in the Vinaya, you get to one, no, I'm just I'm making up a random number, but you get to a lot of precepts, right? Uh, I'm just making it up as I go along here, uh, because I like to be naughty, there's a tribute from Ajahn Brahma. So, uh, it, that's the, that's the Dhamma Kanda, 84,000, right? That's kind of the, the teachings and the suttas. So. If you, so if you, if you are, but basically it comes down to kindness. So. If you are kind, you feel, what do you find? What do you find? What you find is that you feel a freedom within there. Yeah, it is an inner freedom that arises from that kindness. So. And that freedom is a freedom from remorse. So. A freedom from feeling regret to what you have done. So. A freedom from not feeling self-worth. So. A freedom from not feeling self-esteem, because you do feel self-worth. You feel that you are worthy of respect, worthy of all of these kind of things. It comes naturally when you live a life of kindness. And that liberation within is 
far, far more important than this silly liberation without, you know, the idea of doing what you want. It is nothing. It has no value if within you are in the prison of remorse, of regret, of lack of self-worth and all of these kind of things. And there's a nice story about this. There's a story that Ajahn Brahm sometimes tells, uh, and I hope he hasn't told this recently here in Malaysia, because otherwise we're going to repeat things again. I, you may not have heard this story before. And this is a story of uh, two monks in Thailand who were at the house. They were at the house dana. Yeah, you know house dana? You go to someone's house and you have a meal in the house. And uh, so they were in this house, and it was a very fancy house, some kind of posh house in Bangkok, right? And they had this large aquarium in the middle of the house. The two monks were there, these are very senior monks, they were considered enlightened by many, many people, yeah? But no one was sure which one was more wise. Now we're going to find out who was the more wise, right? This is the time to find out. So the, so the aquarium was there, right? So one monk says to the other one, he says, that's terrible. All of these fish are trapped in this aquarium. They have no freedom. We're talking about freedom today. They have no freedom. They're trapped within these four glass walls. What is going to happen? You know, these fish should be put back into the river again, back into the lake, back into the ocean where they belong. They shouldn't be held captive in a, in a fish tank like that. And it's kind of a good point, right? Isn't that a good point? Should we really keep fish trapped in a fish tank? What do you think? Is it bad? Is it okay? Is it neutral? Interesting question. Anything can be an interesting question if you have the right angle on it, right? Should we keep animals in a zoo, for example? It's a good, not a good question. I think probably not such a good idea, but anyway, uh, well, <laughs> humanity does many strange things. So is it a good idea or not? And then this other monk says, well, wait a minute, he said. Uh, remember that when these fish are in the fish tank, uh, yeah, they have many, many advantages. Uh, there are no predators uh, in the fish tank. Uh, a fish in the wild is always hunted by other fish, always has to look ov over his shoulder. I'm not sure if fish have shoulders, but anyway, it, it, has to, it has to kind of look behind. Is there a bigger fish coming behind, right, wanting to eat me or not? And uh, so it's always frightened. In the fish tank, no predators, yeah, unless the owner is really evil and puts a predator in there, but uh, you know, no predators in the fish tank. Yeah. In the wild, the water temperatures, in the summer it's hot, in the winter it's really cold. Yeah, suffering for the fish, always changing water in the fish tank, perfect temperature all the time, yeah, just right for the fish. The scientist does the experiment, okay, fish wants 24.21 degrees, right? This is always 24.21 degrees in that fish tank, yeah. In the wild, you never know whether you're going to have enough food, because in the wild the food sometimes is plentiful, other times it's missing, and it may be the wrong kind of food. Maybe the, the, the fish gets stomach, stomach upset, yeah, tummy upset because of the food not being right. And I'm sure fish also get these things, right, like every, every other creature. In the fish tank, always the perfect food, always the perfect balance of diet and all these kind of things. If you are sick in the fish tank, the fish doctor comes. Any fish doctors here? <laughs> it's not a very common profession, fish doctor, but occasionally you find uh, for fish doctors. Uh, in the wild, no fish doctors. <clears throat> the opposite of the anti-fish doctor, the hunter comes instead and kills you. So it's the opposite of the fish doctor. Uh, and so the idea here is that when you have certain constraints on yourself, uh, you gain a larger liberty in return uh, because of those constraints. Uh, that larger liberty is a freedom from fear, the freedom from all the worries of life, the freedom from all the problems yeah, of existence, because you accept the limitations of a water tank, of an aquarium. And this is exactly the same thing, yeah, when we have rules in our life, these are the walls of the aquarium around us, the stop us from certain dangers. Yes, there is a certain degree to which you cannot follow your freedom of desires. You cannot have the full freedom of desires, but what you gain is far, far more important than what you lose. And anyway, I'm going to show you later on in this talk and see how long we can go on for, but the, actually the idea of freedom of desire is an illusion anyway. There is no freedom of desire. There is only the imprisonment of desire. Desire is actually a prison, and there is no such thing as a freedom of desires in the first place. So this is the first thing that we really need to understand. And this is the first thing I think that as Buddhists we already have some understanding of. 
But then there's the next level, huh? and that the next level is starts to get far more interesting. Yeah? And this comes back to this idea I started out with, that we really have no understanding where real happiness is. Uh, the majority of people in the world, they have never experienced any happiness apart from the sensory realm. Uh. The happiness we have is like, this is a beautiful center. I have to admit, you've done a very good job here, Bobby. I'm not sure if you are responsible for this, but this is really nice, this room. Uh. Who is responsible? Ah, oh, Dr. Victor Wee, and now I see you. Okay, good. Uh, wonderful. Nice to see you again. I didn't actually recognize you over there. I haven't, my eyesight is getting so bad. I can just see a blur, but I can actually, I do recognize you now. Okay, wonderful. It's a very beautiful spot. Congratulations on having built this floor up here. I knew it was coming. This is the first time I see it. So that's wonderful. Yeah. So, we, this other kind of, these are the things that we enjoy. Yeah, we enjoy good food. We enjoy good relationships. We enjoy the sensory realm. Yeah. But we forget that we are actually trapped in the sensory realm. There is something more in the world. There's something far more satisfying than the sensory realm. And the majority of people have no idea that this even exists. Yeah, and that those things that are way beyond the sensory realm, these are the things that we can access through meditation practice. These are the joys, the pity of meditation. The other pamudja, the gladness that you get from practicing the path in the right way. Huh? This is the beautiful, profound peace and calm that you can access in meditation practice. Huh? And it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. Huh? One of the extraordinary things about the path of meditation, once you have accessed a little bit, little bit of bliss, there is more bliss down the track. Yeah? Once you have accessed that bliss, there's even more bliss down the track. And so it goes on like that for a long time, right? Uh, this is so extraordinary. Most people in the world have no idea these things even exist. But if you know that it exists, you know it is far superior to the sensory realm, and you know that you're moving towards the very meaning of life itself when you go there. So if you don't even know these things actually do exist, how on earth are you going to be able to make the choice to choose these things? You can't choose them because you don't know they are there. You don't know how this world works. You don't know the human mind, what the human mind is capable of. And because you don't know that, it is impossible for you to make those choices. And this is what I mean. The idea of freedom of choice is a complete misunderstanding. Because the misunderstanding is that we are limited by certain factors. The things that we are limited by is our delusion, our lack of understanding of the world, not seeing the world clearly, not understanding that there are things available in this world that are extraordinarily interesting, meaningful and profound. This is the problem. And this is why the whole idea of free will, it, you may have the idea of free will is something that is often debated, especially in Western philosophy. Do people have free will or not? But it's kind of irrelevant. You can choose between an apple and an orange. You can choose Chinese food. Or, or, I don't know what, okay. What is the best time? Hong Kong food and Shanghai food. Yeah, you can choose between those. You can choose between French cuisine or Italian cuisine. You can choose Australian food. No, there's not such a thing as Australian food. Uh, forget about that one. You can, you, you can go and see the wall of China or you can see the wall outside the Bodhinyana monastery. Okay, there's, there's a bit of difference there, but it's not that great. These are variations on a theme. It is not a big deal whether you can have a Coke or a glass of water. I have now, I can choose between coffee and ginger drink. It's already a difficult enough choice, but it doesn't really matter, right, whether you have a coffee or a ginger drink. So the freedom of choice, the idea of free will, is really overestimated. Because the choices, the things we choose between, actually it makes almost no difference at all. The real choices that are interesting are the choices we don't even understand, because we are deluded, we are blinded from understanding what is going on there. So when we talk about freedom of will and freedom of choice in Buddhism, what we really need to talk about is the idea of removing the delusion, removing the misunderstanding, removing the darkness in our mind that stops us from seeing the larger reality. Once you see the larger reality, once you understand what is actually available in the world, what happiness actually is possible on the Buddhist path, in the practiced in the right way, once you understand that, then you can make real and informed choices because you understand what the world really is like. That is the real problem. So when I say 
Freedom of will. This is what I mean. Freedom of will means removing the delusion, removing those things that blind us from seeing that larger reality. Then there is a hope that we actually can make some good choices. Yeah, this is what this really is about. There's a beautiful simile in the sutta that make this point in a very nice way here. Yeah. This is a simile that I have often taught, but I will teach it again here. Yeah. And this is a simile of two friends are walking through the jungle, walking through the forest. Yeah, the forest is where you cannot see very far. Yeah, you can maybe see just a few meters ahead, especially if you are in the tropics. Yeah, like you are here in Malaysia. If you go into the jungle in Malaysia, you cannot, cannot see very far ahead of you. In ancient India, it was a little bit like that. You are kind of hindered. You don't have a view. You can't see very far out any, any particular direction. And this is exactly what the sensory realm is like. You can't see very far. You don't have a bird's eye view. You're hemmed in by the five senses, always being, we're always being bombarded by impressions of the five senses. That sight, sounds always coming onto us all the time. We cannot really see what is going on. And because we are limited, and because we are in the jungle of the five senses, we have no real understanding of life. This is why we cannot see the higher happinesses. And so these two friends, they're walking through the jungle, and then they come to a hill. They are sometimes said to be a mountain, but they come to this hill. And so one friend says to them, well, let's walk this hill. So this is like coming to the spiritual path, right? You've been walking in the five senses for all your life, and one day you come to the spiritual path, this goes up this hill. And the other friend says, nah, I couldn't be bothered, yeah, spiritual life is for losers, yeah, I don't want to go practice a spiritual life, yeah, I'm going to stand at the bottom, if you want to walk the hill, whatever, do what do as you see fit. So this other friend, he walks up the hill by himself, and so he practices a spiritual path, right? And he gets to the very top, and when he gets to the very top, he looks out from the view at the top of the hill. And when he looks out from the view at the top of the hill, he sees all kinds of things, right? He sees the paddy fields down below, he sees the little rivers going through, he sees the roads, he sees the little villages in between. He can see the landscape laid out before him, seeing it very clearly in front of him. And then he says, wow, this is extraordinary. You practice the spiritual path and you see all of this stuff. He gets the bird's eye view on reality. And so he shouts down to his friend, who is still standing at the bottom of the mountain, and says, Hey, friend, you won't believe it. When I stand on top of this mountain, I see all of these things. I see the paddy fields, I see the rivers, I see the roads, I see the villages, I see all of these things laid out in front of me. And then the friend at the bottom says, Nah, I don't believe a word of what you're saying. What kind of friend is that, right? He doesn't believe a word of what you're saying. What's the point of friendship, anyway? That's another sidetrack. If you're a friend, you're supposed to believe your friends, right? This is the idea of Kalyanamitta, is that we have some trust in our friends. If someone has a nice meditation experience, you should always say, wow, well done, it's so inspiring. If you can have it, I too can maybe have it, right? We should rejoice in our each other's successes on the spiritual path. So this friend at the bottom, being very foolish, not being a real Kalyanamitta, so the friend on top of the mountain, he comes down to the bottom of the mountain. He grabs his friend by the arm. This is like the Buddha, right? This is what the Buddha does. He grabs you by the arm. You are going to resist. Is that right? You will resist the Buddha because everyone resists the Buddha. Why do we resist the Buddha? Because the Buddha is challenging. That's why we resist the Buddha. The Buddha says, be kind all the time. He said, nah, now is not the time to be kind. They need to hear a piece of my mind. Yeah. So I'm going to let tell them off. No, says the Buddha, don't do that. Okay, because we don't really want to hear the Buddha has to say, because actually it is challenging, the spiritual path is challenging. Yeah. So the Buddha has to come all the way down to the bottom of the mountain, grabs the friend by the arm, pulls him up to the top of the mountain. Yeah. You remember Ajahn Brahm, simile of the truck, of, not, not of the uh, worm and the lovely pile of dung? Yeah. You know that story? Yeah. Anyone doesn't know that story? Yeah. Everyone knows the story. Okay, cool. Okay, that makes it easy. So, yes, the 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 the, uh, the worm holds on to the pile of dung, right? This is just like the fellow at the bottom of the mountain don't doesn't want to go to the top uh, because the dung is warm. The dung is food for the worm. Wow, the dung is such a beautiful thing. Uh, and the other friend is in heaven. Says you don't, you don't you don't you have no idea what is nice. I live in the heavenly realm. That's where the real nice things are found. Not in a pile of dung. Uh, you dummy, come with me. No, no, I want to stay in my dung. Uh, 
This is the same thing with this guy at the bottom of the mountain. I want to stay at the bottom of the mountain. I don't want to see the view. Huh? So the Buddha comes down and he wants to pull us out of the dung here. Are you ready to come out of the dung or do you want to hold on to the dung here? How many people want to hold on to the dung here? One, one over here? Okay, anyone else? Uh, okay, only one. That's pretty good for a large group of people. Okay, only one person wants to hold on to the we, It's interesting, right? Because we are all a little bit like this. We want to hold on to the dung a little bit and we also want the spiritual path a little bit. Uh, this is just the nature of human beings. Uh, I don't, I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm also a bit like that. Yeah, I admit, uh, I also want to hold on to the dung sometimes. Uh, and I'm embarrassed about it. Uh, Half half, yeah? We, we, it's, we have two minds, right? Isn't that the case? The, the world, we are in two minds very often. Spiritual and worldly. We can't really make up our mind properly. Huh? And so the Buddha comes down, he grabs the friend by the arm, huh? and he pulls him up to the mountain. Huh? And when he comes up to the mountain top, he says, well, what do you see here? And the other friend becomes a bit sheepish. Oh yeah, <laughs> you're right. I see fi paddy fields, I see roads, I see rivers, I see little villages. Huh? You were right. And then the other friend says, well, just now, when you were at the bottom of the mountain, you said this is all nonsense, right? This is all nonsense what you're talking about. I don't believe a word of it. How come you were saying that before? And he says, the reason I was saying that before is because I was blocked by this whole mountain. The mountain was in my way. That's why I couldn't see the view. And then the Buddha says, the mountain is a simile for the five hindrances. The five hindrances are the defilements of the mind. The five hindrances are the delusion. The five hindrances are the things that block our ability from getting that larger view of reality. This is the problem. Yeah. The problem is not that we have freedom of will. We don't have freedom of the will because we are held by the five hindrances. We are held by the delusion of the mind, which makes us incapable of seeing things that are actually there. That is the problem. This is exactly what I've been talking about all the way along now. The idea that it's a delusion that stops us from exercising a will that is useful at all. So once we start to understand, once we, the beginning of this understanding is actually having faith and confidence in the teachings of the Buddha. Faith and confidence do have an important part in the Buddhist teachings, because once you have faith and confidence, it opens up another possibility in our world. Once you have confidence in these teachings, then there is a chance, at least you will follow along, and then you may have an opportunity to experience something higher. Then the delusion will go down. Then you will start to see the truth of these things. So the beginning of freedom is actually faith and confidence, because then you have the ability maybe to go there. So this is how freedom gradually arises, the freedom of the will, the freedom of choice, because we start to understand what really is the distinction between happiness and suffering here. I'd like to say that one of the ways of defining the idea of right view, yeah, right view, we're just talking about that in the Sutta class, we're doing the idea of right view, and uh, uh, right view is kind of defined in many different ways in the suttas and very often it is defined in understanding rebirth, understanding kamma, these kind of things. But a very simple way of understanding the idea of, of right view is that right view is understanding the difference between happiness and suffering. That is really right view. That is what it is all about. And only when you have that kind of right view does freedom become possible because then you can move towards happiness. Most people don't know where happiness and suffering is because of that, because they have wrong view. So starting with the right view, starting to understand that there is a deeper reality here. This is what makes freedom possible. So have that right view. Try to understand the Buddha. When the Buddha says all of these things are available on the path, the happiness that we cling to as human beings, the lovely pile of dung that we have, isn't that interesting. We need to actually focus and move towards something higher. In the beginning, we hold on a little bit. We hold on to two worlds. We have one foot in each camp, one foot in each world. And gradually, we shift the weight over to the foot that is standing in the spiritual world and lifting up the foot that is standing in the ordinary worldly kind of happinesses. And this way, we are shifting. We're gaining a real view, a bird's eye view of reality, seeing where happiness is really to be found. But there's one more level to this starting off with morality, then understanding the profundity of meditation where real spiritual happiness is to be found. 
Remember that there is also existence and rebirth that corresponds to profound states of meditation. But there's one more thing, and this is kind of the most profound thing of all that. And I remember Ajahn Brahm, he al always makes this distinction. Is anyone here who has never heard about Ajahn Brahm? Any, anyone? I, I used to ask whether is there anyone who has heard of Ajahn Brahm, but that was a pointless question because everyone has always heard of Ajahn Brahm. But I, then I started asking, is there anyone who has not heard of Ajahn Brahm? Everyone has heard of Brahm. Okay, cool. So you, you, you know him. I know him very well. I've been living with Ajahn Brahm for almost 30 years. So it's a long, long time. I probably know him better than you. But anyway, so um, yeah, one of the things that Ajahn Brahm sometimes says in his Dhamma talks, he says that there's two kinds of uh, freedom, freedom of desire and freedom from desire, right? Uh, but uh, remember that the freedom of desire is actually not really a freedom at all. Uh, yeah, It is actually more like the imprisonment of desire. And this is what I've been talking about just now, the delusion that we have in our life, uh, that we're going to find some kind of happiness there. Actually, it is just a pursuit of things that never actually re give, give real satisfaction. Desire is actually a kind of imprisonment. Uh, and to be able to see this, you have to go into the deeper aspects of meditation practice. The deeper your meditation becomes, the more still your mind is, the more calm and peaceful you are, the more happy you are. Have you noticed that in your meditation? Yeah, When it starts to calm down and you become peaceful, actually it starts to become very delightful. And what is happening when you are becoming peaceful is that your desire your will, the doing of the mind, that whole thing is starting to disappear. Yeah, You don't do anything anymore. You don't have any will, you don't have any volition. There's no desire there at all. And the deeper you go in meditation, the less desire, the less will, the less activity there is. And when activity, doing, desire is completely gone, that is when you find the highest kind of happiness, uh, when the mind is completely unified, uh, when there's no movement in the mind whatsoever, that is where the highest happiness is. What does that mean? And what it means is that as long as there is the will, as long as there is doing, uh, you understand for the first time in your life that actually the will, the doing, the desire of the mind, that is a torturer. You have been tortured all along when you made all of these choices. When the will is gone, that is when you feel liberation. This is a far higher liber liberation than you ever had before, when the will is completely gone. So the idea of freedom of the will is madness, because the will itself is an imprisonment. So as soon as you're talking about will and desire and doing things, that itself is a kind of imprisonment of the mind. And when the mind really gives up that will completely, only then do you experience real freedom. So this kind of subverts, this undermines the whole idea of freedom of will, because the will itself is the problem. And you can see how profound it is, and you can see how difficult it is for the, anyone in the world to really understand this. And this is something that only if you do practice meditation practice, you can start to get a glimpse into this reality. Real freedom is when the will disappears. So freedom of choice is an oxymoron. Freedom of will is an oxymoron. Will and choice, by definition, are imprisonments. And I like this idea that also sometimes you hear with Ajahn Brahm. I, you know, all, everything I say is from Ajahn Brahm. I just keep on repeating what he says. And I'm quite happy to do that. Actually, I think it is a, uh, the job of a good monk, to my mind, is to actually teach the teaching of the Buddha. And uh, Ajahn Brahm, uh, because he's my teacher, he kind of also comes into that. Uh, but one of the things that he says, which I find is very nice, is the idea that uh, we are all in prison. Yeah, we are in prison. And what we do in our life when we play out in the five senses, we eat this kind of food, that kind of food, we have this kind of house, that kind of house, this kind of car, that kind of car, this kind of relationship, this kind of status, whatever it is. When we play out in that world, what we are doing is that we are, it's like painting our prison. We are in a prison cell, right? Uh, the prison cell is grey and boring, let's paint it blue, yay, blue prison cell, right? Uh, and then we paint it yellow. Yellow is beautiful. A bit of yellow, a bit of orange, a bit of nice red colors. Yeah, The colors of this building are very nice. I like, I like coming to this building. It's kind of a standout building in this neighborhood. Beautiful colors on the outside. I saw that when I came here. So well done again to the, to the uh, 
committee and the people have looked after all of these things. Uh, but what we're doing is just painting our prison cell here. So what do you, what would you like to do? Would you like to paint your prison cell here? Would you like to have all kinds of nice amenities in the prison cell here? Or would you like to leave the prison cell here? What is your choice? Sir? Most people would like to leave the prison cell, right? It's not really good enough just to paint it and make it nice and colorful. Huh? But this is really what the world is like. Yeah? Painting the prison cell huh? and one day coming out, moving out of that cell. That is where real freedom is to be found. Huh? So, just to summarize for you very briefly the idea behind this talk. Yeah? The idea behind this talk is that freedom huh, is really misunderstood by the world. Huh? The world, the kind of freedom that people are always looking for, actually is no freedom at all. If the American Constitution, when we talk about freedom of choice or, or the freedom to pursue happiness, is actually quite meaningless because no one understands where happiness is to be found. That's why we need to add some Buddhist paragraphs to the American Constitution. I'm not sure if that will go down well with the American Congress, but we will, we will suggest that when we have an opportunity. <laughs> And then the American Constitution maybe will start to make sense, yeah? Because the problem is not that a freedom of will. The freedom of will is overrated, uh, because the freedom of will only works if we understand what is really worthwhile willing, what is worthwhile choosing. Uh. So we need to remove the delusion in our minds. Uh. We need to start to have more right view about the nature of reality. Uh. And once you start to remove that delusion, new avenues open up. New possibilities that you never knew even existed open up in your life. And if you are practicing Buddhism in the right way, and you're actually having success on that path, what you should be seeing is new possibilities, new avenues gradually opening up in your mind, seeing new choices that never even knew existed. Then you have the opportunity to make good choices in your life then you have real freedom of, freedom of choice uh, because you understand where happiness really is to be found. Uh. So, I have been talking for an hour already. I can't believe it, what happened to that hour. But the hour has disappeared, uh, gone down the drain. I hope it hasn't gone down the drain. Uh, but uh, that is uh, my talk for tonight, is the difference between the ordinary freedoms of the world and the idea of Buddhist freedoms. The Buddhist freedom goes even beyond that because the Buddhist freedom also has the idea of insight at the very end of the path that I haven't talked so much about. That is the highest kind of freedom that you get through insight. But this is enough to give you a taste of Buddhist freedom. So uh, I would now like to give you an opportunity to uh, ask questions or comment or I usually say complain if you wish, but please no complaints. Just, uh, we just go for the, uh, if you have positive feedback, great. Negative feedback, no thanks. We'll leave that out. <laughs> okay, so please fire away everyone here. Ajahn? Yes. What would you add to the Constitution? What I would add to the, what I would add to the American Constitution? That's a good question. Well, I would, I would, I, I think I would, what we would have to add would be, um, uh, something about uh, uh, the um, the nature of happiness, right? And uh, what the world, maybe something simple like what the world thinks is happiness is actually suffering, but what the noble one thinks is is uh, is uh, suffering. Well, no, what the noble one thinks is happiness that the world thinks is suffering, or something like that. Uh, there's something simple to kind of remind people that there are noble people in the world with a higher vision of reality, and that is what we should follow in our pursuit of happiness. Uh, I don't know, something like that. <laughs> That's a beautiful saying, yeah? what the noble ones uh, think is suffering, the world think is happiness. Uh, what the noble ones know as happiness, the world think is suffering. Yeah? It means that reality, the way we perceive it, is normally upside down. We don't understand happiness and suffering, right? And this is why this is the summary of the idea of right view. The summary of the idea of right view is really to understand happiness and suffering where it is found, what it is about. Uh, and all the things that have to do with rebirth and karma and all of these kind of things, they actually come under that idea, underneath the idea of understanding happiness and suffering, uh, which is fascinating. Four Noble Truths, of course, also is really about happiness and suffering, right? First Noble Truth about suffering. Uh, that is really a summary. It's a very nice, to my mind, a nice way of thinking about the idea of right view. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Ajay. The Australian Constitution, 
does do, I don't know if Australia has a constitution. Huh? I am dodgy Australian. Yeah. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not the real deal. I, I. I was born in Norway, and yes, I now have an Australian passport. But this is convenience, you know. I have to admit, uh, I don't really feel all that Australian. Uh, so I don't. I, I don't care. I don't care about the Australian constitution, unfortunately. Uh, I don't feel Norwegian either. I don't feel anything really, which is kind of nice. Yeah. Don't have. Don't have to have much identity. Identity is a waste of time. Uh, so. <laughs> okay. Any cultural bias of uh, the concept of freedom between the Western society and uh, the Eastern society? Is there a cultural? I think the I think the cultural bias is uh, not not the idea of freedom as such. I think everyone wants to be free. Yeah, I think maybe the kind of freedom is uh, different. Uh, yeah, the, maybe the kind of freedom is different in the uh, different societies a little bit. And. Uh, American society, you know, the bias is you want to have guns and big cars. Uh, but uh, in other societies, it may be a different kind of freedoms that we are looking for. Uh, and uh, I think that is maybe the main, main difference. But I think everyone wants freedom to some extent. No one wants to be imprisoned. Uh, no one wants to be um, uh, circumscribed everywhere so that you can't do at all what you want. That is very unpleasant to be a human being when you can never do what you want. Uh, and uh, so uh, there is a sense that uh, I think that it is universal feel, you know, universal thing in the human mind that we want to be free in one way or another. And especially you start to understand this becomes very obvious when you think things like self-worth. Everyone wants to have self-worth. No one wants to feel bad about themselves. And that is a kind of freedom that I think everyone wants. And if you start to practice things like meditation practice and you start to feel the liberation of the mind, when the mind is free of hindrances, is free of all these oppressive things, uh, it is obvious that you want that. Yeah, It's obvious that everyone wants these things because they are, it's kind of just our human nature to, to, uh, to, to move towards uh, uh, satisfaction and contentment. We are always driven by desire in our life. Everyone, this is universal for human beings. We all have this craving, and the purpose of craving is to end craving. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? But that's really the purpose of craving. Why not just stop it straight away? Actually, no, we crave so we can end the craving. We want to find contentment, in other words. We want to find satisfaction. Yeah. And this is a universal thing, and that is freedom, that contentment, that satisfaction. That is a kind of liberation that we're all seeking for and want. Yeah. Thank you, Ajahn. Uh, hi, Ajahn. Um, I was thinking about the idea of introducing the five precepts mm -hmm. into, the, into the American Constitution. Right? The first precept is, thou shalt not kill, yeah. and therefore thou shalt not own or carry any weapons. Or weapons. <laughs> right. yeah, yeah. And then the second precept is, thou shalt not take what is not yours. Yeah. So you should not be betting businesses or taking away things from other countries. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Good thing there are not so many Americans here today, so we are. <laughs> so, yeah, no, so, in, indeed, yeah, no, I mean, that, that's, you know, we could add a moral code, yeah, and uh, that might be very liberating for people, you know, add the five precepts to the Constitution. That's very interesting. I, I think the problem is that, uh, you know, one of the ideas of freedom, I think, is that we have to voluntarily take these things on. Uh, it's only then that they are powerful. Uh, and uh, I notice that in my own life, it's only when I start to see the power of the precepts, the power of kindness, that it actually becomes powerful in my own life. Uh, and I try now my very best to be kind at all times. I don't always succeed, but I, I, that's what I try, because I think I have come to understand that this is incredibly important. Uh, and every time you forget the idea of kindness, you're letting yourself down more than anyone else. Uh, and when you see that, and when you understand that, how can you not keep the five precepts? How can you not keep eight precepts? How can you not keep, you know, all of these things all the time? So I think that is, uh, that is where the idea of freedom also comes in. Freedom means that you have the, um, uh, you have to voluntarily undertake, you have to have the freedom to undertake these things. If we force people to be kind, it's not real kindness. Real kindness has to come from the heart, and that is when it is powerful. And this can, for example, this is one thing that you see in certain monasteries, and you see it in certain places around the world. Some monasteries, they have a very strict routine. 
Yeah, and you kind of you get up at four in the morning. Everyone meditates together. You have chanting together. Uh, everyone has to follow a certain routine, uh, uh, and that may work for some people. But to me, for meditation and the whole Buddhist path really to work, it has to come from yourself. You have to want to do it, and when you want to do it because you're undertaking it of your own free will, that is when it is extraordinarily powerful. So the job of an abbot like Ajahn Brahm, or the Buddha, or whatever, is actually to motivate us to understand the importance of these things, It's to instill right view in us. And once you understand, you will do it, regardless. And you may have heard, there's another story about Ajahn Brahm. Yeah, I, I, I shouldn't quote Ajahn Brahm quite so much, it gets embarrassing after a while, but he, <laughs> he um, has a story, I, I think it is taken from The Art of War, a famous book written in China a long time ago by whatever, I, can't, I don't know the details, and apparently one of the stories in there is that is this general who has, a, has perfect, uh, perfect discipline in the army, right? Uh, and so they ask him, how, how come your discipline is so perfect? Uh, and he said, it's because I allow my soldiers to do whatever they want. Uh, and I say, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? <laughs> do whatever they want. Well, he says, what I do, I instill in them a world view, a way of thinking in such a way that they want to do exactly what they're supposed to be doing, right? So I motivate them in such a way that they actually want to do what is right. They want to do the thing that is perfect discipline. And then it happens automatically. And so this is the job of a good abbot, this is the job of any good teacher, is to make people understand these teachings in such a profound way that you really want to do these things. If I can make you become super duper, even more kind, I'm sure you're kind already, even more kind after, you know, after today or after whatever, then I have succeeded as a teacher. If I read the word of the Buddha, I become more kind as a consequence. The Buddha has succeeded in teaching me. I'm very hard to teach, by the way. I'm very kind of very stubborn and difficult individual. I'm not joking, yeah. <laughs> but gradually, I have learned over a long time as a monk, thirty years, I have learned also that this is actually the way. Yeah. This is the path. Then it really starts to happen. This is the power of this path. So yes, we could lay down the five precepts in the American Constitution, but actually, we should lay down something more. We should lay down something to do with wisdom, uh, so that people really start to reflect on their own life. That is where the real transformation happens. So. And uh, you know, one of the things that I find so um, so sad sometimes is when I see leadership in the world being so bad. Uh, I see bad leaders in the world, uh, leaders who don't lead by example, uh, because leadership matters enormously. Uh, when the leaders are good, it trickles down into society, into everyone else. Uh, they talk about trickle down economics. Trickle down economics doesn't work. Yeah, yeah? isn't that that right? Uh, Victor, yeah, that's kind of <laughs> this. Is, <laughs> so trickle down economic doesn't work, but trickle down morality works. Uh, yeah, and this is actually found in the suttas. Uh, if you have good leaders, uh, the next layer of people underneath the leader they get affected by the leader, and then the layer under that gets affected, and the whole society gets better as a consequence. Uh, but if we have bad leaders, leaders who lie, leaders who cheat, uh, leaders who do bad things, that too trickles down in society. We get really bad society. So it matters enormously that we have good leaders. Uh, yeah? And I think that sometimes people ask, how should I, what should I choose in elections? Yeah? What is the right kind of leader? And I would often say, well, sometimes people think we should choose the leader, leader who is the most intelligent or the kind of leader who has the best plan for the future. I would say, choose the leader with the greatest integrity, with the greatest sense of morality. That is the most important thing, because then you get a healthy society. It doesn't matter if the economy doesn't grow so fast, because a healthy society comes from integrity and kindness and morality. That is the kind of leaders I would choose. And uh, sometimes I shake my head at the kind of people who get into positions of power in this world. It's kind of terrible. I'm not going to mention any names, but I'm sure you can have some idea what I'm talking about. Uh, you, you missed it. What do, what do you mean you missed it? You were here. <laughs> you decide. Yeah, this is for you to decide. You make that choice. Uh, yeah. And now it is now it is your wisdom. Again, you know to choose which one was the wiser one. <laughs> Ajahn, I think I, I think Ajahn Brahm said is the wise one is the one who said that actually maybe the fish tank is not so bad. Yeah, he was the wise one. 
the one who said they should be free was maybe the one who was talking quicker than he was thinking here. Maybe. But you, you, you make up your own mind on that one. <laughs> Ajahn Brahmali. Where is the... Oh, there. Yeah. Okay. Please. Yeah. Uh, just now you gave me a, a description of your trip to India. Yeah. Now he has planted a desire for me to go there. <laughs> So we are all lay people, we have cravings. Yeah. So can uh, Achan enlighten us? Uh, now that I have this desire, is it a good craving or a bad craving? And uh, generally, uh, we have cravings yeah. almost every day. Yeah. Right? So like some normal cravings is, when I'm hungry, I will think of the good taste restaurant. <laughs> To go and have a one tan me. Yeah. So, as lay people, we are like that. Yeah. So, can uh, Ajahn give us some advice? Yeah. Right. How far we should go uh, as lay people in order for us to also progress spiritually? Okay. Thank you. Good. Good question. Uh, please go to that restaurant. Right. <laughs> enjoy the food. Yeah, that's okay. You can enjoy the food. Sometimes we become like dry Buddhists. Uh, we become so serious in our practice that we lose all joy and happiness in life. Don't become a dry Buddhist. I tell you, it's the worst kind of Buddhist. Buddhism is supposed to make people happy. If we can make the Buddhist path the happy path, we will inspire the next generation to come after us. After a while, they get fed up with the blooming internet because the internet actually is so much suffering, and they want to become Buddhist instead and kind of practice the Buddhist path. You know, sometimes you look around and you see the old generations are Buddhist, and the next generation they are all what are they? Free thinkers. There is no such thing as a free thinker, but that's what they think they are. They are uh, more like imprisoned thinkers, uh, because thinking is a conditioned process in itself. Uh. But so we need to make show that Buddhism is there to make us happy. That's the whole purpose of Buddhist teaching. Uh. It is to improve the quality of our lives, not to detract from the quality of our lives. This is such an important point. Uh. When we meditate, we need to find the happiness in the meditation practice. Uh, when we practice the virtue and morality, seeing the happiness and the, and the joy in being kind and caring in the world. Uh, this is how we inspire the next generation, understanding that this actually has to do with the very meaning of life itself. Uh, and not so, it's not some kind of crazy idea, we are just kind of practicing from the past, which actually doesn't have any meaning in modern life. It has a lot heaps of meaning in any kind of life, modern, ancient, anywhere between, or whatever. So coming back to the idea of craving, yeah. So you you want to come to you want to come to India now, yeah. So okay, go to India, yeah. The Buddha says that uh, everyone should go. It's good to go to India every now and again. Go on a nice tour, yeah. You want to come with me? Come with me. It's a nice tour, yeah. I'm kind of easy going. So come with me to India. I don't know if I will go, so maybe you won't get opportunity. But if I go, you can come with me, and uh, we will go in. Nice hotels, yeah, so you can relax, you can sleep well at night. Uh, nice, decent restaurants, you can have your nice meal. You may not, I'm not sure how much Chinese food there is in India, but you have, may have to kind of deal with the uh, Indian food or, or something like that. Uh, uh, so please come along, and uh, it may be very interesting and very inspiring for you. Uh, and then we will give nice talks at each of the places, and we will recommend see what the Buddha uh, uh, said in those particular places. Uh, but you are quite right. There is a distinction between good craving and bad craving. Yeah, yeah. This is a very important distinction. Yeah? And going to India is probably a good craving. Yeah? Depends a little bit on why you do it. If you just go do it because you want to see the sights or whatever, maybe okay, not so interesting. But if you do it for a real spiritual purpose, it's probably a good kind of craving. Yeah. And life is full of that. Life is full of this difference between good and bad desires. And this is talked about head-on in the suttas. Uh, uh, some monk uh, challenges Venerable Ananda about this, uh, and he says, how can the Buddha say on the one hand that craving and desire is bad, uh, and on the other hand he says that uh, there is something called the Kanda Samadhi, one of the four Idipadas, which are one of the four ways of creating a powerful mind. How can there be chanda, both be part of the path and also be a problem? What are you talking about? And Venerable Ananda says very, very wisely that, well, the reason is because you need chanda, you need desire 
to get going on the path. You need desire to keep the five precepts, you need desire to practice meditation, you need desire to get going, but through that desire, through practicing the right way, you overcome desire. Desire leads to the end of the desire. So what we need to do is we need to choose the right kinds of desires. That is the critical thing. Not abandon all desire, but choose the right kind of desires. There's a hierarchy of desires. The good, good, really good desires, medium desires, bad desires, utterly deplorable desires at the very bottom, really evil ones. So don't do the bad desires. Yeah, If you want to kill someone, don't follow that desire. Yeah, bad desire. If you want to steal, don't go stealing because it's a bad desire. So the first thing that we do is that we keep the five precepts that already removes quite a lot of desire straight there from the equation. Once you keep the five precepts, the next thing that you do is that you try to practice the idea of morality and kindness to as high a degree as you possibly can. If you are going to be kind consistently in your life, all the time, there's a large number of desires that you have to abandon. Yeah, you can no longer really afford to get angry. Yeah, you start to con you start to become more aware of overcoming your anger, for example, in life. Yeah, all of these kind of desires. Yeah, so the large number of desires that you overcome by uh, simply by the idea of being kind and living well. When it comes to the sensory realm, because you were talking specifically about going to the restaurant, right, and these kind of things. Those are very minor things. Don't worry about those things. Worry about the big issues. Worry about the areas where you can no longer be kind. That is the problem. Because if you are able to be consistently kind in the way you speak, the way you act, the way you think about other people, you're going to have a lot of success on the spiritual path, regardless of how you enjoy yourself in the restaurant or you enjoy your, your sensory world outside. That is the most important thing. So you Put away those desires that stop you from living with the kindness. That is the most important thing. The, the, the sensory desires of the world, don't worry too much about that. It's not a big problem. If you worry too much about those things, then probably going to end up having a miserable life. And that's not what you want to do. So this is really the right way. Look at things. Too often, I think one of the problems in Buddhism is that we think too much about the idea of the sensory world and sensory desires as being bad. But the Buddha says it's not a big problem, the sensory world. What is a really big problem is anger, bad conduct, all of these kind of things. That is where we should put the emphasis. And the remarkable thing is that when you start to do that, you start to feel more happy, you start to feel more joyful in life, some of the sensual desires in the world, they start to fade away anyway, because you have an alternative source of happiness. The thing about human life is we want to be happy. If you have an alternative source of happiness, the sensory happiness becomes less important by, by nature, because you have an alternative source. If you don't have the alternative source of happiness coming through the spiritual life, of course you're going to be attached to sensual pleasures, because you don't have an alternative. But as you learn to live on the spiritual path, you find a higher kind of happiness, that is where you can gradually let go a little bit of the sensory world around you. So I would say to each one of you, please live in a happy way. Enjoy life. It's okay to enjoy life. You can travel around, you can enjoy good and wholesome relationships in your life, you can enjoy good food in your life, you can enjoy the pleasures of the world, but at the same time, be kind, be caring, be understanding, be compassionate for the world, have less anger in your life, don't watch the news too often, because it make you angry. <laughs> be wise about how you live your life, that is the most important thing. Yeah? Don't become a super strict Buddhist who has a miserable life, because it is useless, it is pointless. That is not what we want to do in this existence. And then you're going to be on the right track. Shift your desires a little bit away from the kind of bad desires towards having more desires to being kind and caring. Then you're going to be on the right track. Yeah. Am I making any sense to you at all? Huh? Yeah? Great. Okay, sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Yeah. Hi, morning Ajahn. Thanks for sharing that, Dhamma. Yeah, please. Very happy to do so. Yeah. So I have a question regarding the the fact that we have two foots, one foot in the spiritual and one foot in the worldly. Yeah. So how do we incline the mind or encourage the mind to actually put more foot or towards the spiritual 
Can you speak about that? Sure. So how do we kind of incline more towards the spiritual path so and kind of give up a little bit on the other worldly path? And what you have to do really is that you have to brainwash yourself. <laughs> and uh, I remember when I first came to Bodhinyana Monastery in Perth, this is almost 30 years ago now, and Ajahn Brahm said, have you come here to get brainwashed? And I, and I said, no way, and I still got brainwashed. <laughs> it's weird, isn't it? I, so, <laughs> so the, the, the thing is that we get brainwashed regardless. This is kind of a consequence of the Buddhist idea of non-self. Yeah? If there is no self, there's nothing inside of you that can resist the brainwashing of the world. We are conditioned beings. What happens to what we are as human beings is a sum total of all the conditions that work on us. This is what we are. Conditions in this life, conditions in past life, conditions when we grew up, all of these kind of things. And so we are all of uh, these kind of things. So you have to allow yourself to be basically gradually conditioned by the Buddha's teachings. Uh, reflect on them. Try to understand what is going on. What are these teachings really about? Yeah, Listen to good teachers. Uh, I would recommend uh, the number one teacher is of course the Buddha. So you can read the suttas if you like and I would really recommend that. Uh, you can listen to people who explain the suttas, but people who do it well uh, there is a, all kinds of teachers that teach the sutta, but some people do it better than others. So choose a few teachers that you trust, uh, that you know teach them well. Uh, and after a while, you know, come down to a few teachers. Don't kind of go too broad in the number of people you listen to, because uh, it just gets really confusing after a while. Um, you know, you have, you have to go into Vajrayana, Mahayana, different Theravadas, and, and you mix that with pure land and a bit of Sokai, Gakkai, or whatever, and you kind of, everything becomes very confusing after a while. So you kind of narrow it down a little bit, so you kind of know where the real, the real things are. And I would recommend the early Buddhist texts and early Buddhist teachings as the most important ones, uh, and focus on that. That's what I would really recommend. Uh, and I think that is a reasonable recommendation. Even people who are Mahayana tradition will sometimes agree on that, uh, which is kind of fascinating. Yeah. So, uh, and then keep on listening. Uh, keep on, uh, you know, inquiring. Think for yourself. Uh, don't think that you have to believe anything. Ask yourself if it really is true or not. And then gradually, as you inquire into these teachings, one or two things will happen. Either your confidence in these teachings will grow, and you will actually start to feel this really is about the meaning of life. Yeah, This actually, this is it. This is what I've been looking for all along. Yeah? This is what I found to my, kind of my, which was extraordinarily interesting. I realized after a while that I have actually somehow stumbled across the very answer to the meaning of life. Once you feel that you have found the answer to the meaning of life, you have no choice anymore. You have to dedicate and commit yourself. How can you not commit yourself if you have found the answer to the meaning of life? And it's kind of obvious in a sense, yeah, when you think about it, that this is the answer to the meaning of life. Why? Well, because human beings, we are craving beings, just like we discussed here before. And our craving is always geared towards finding some kind of satisfaction. If you look into your mind and look at what craving says, it always says, if you do this, you will be satisfied, you will find contentment, you will find real meaning here. But of course it doesn't work. Craving does not get satisfied by following it. And then the Buddha comes along and says that actually, through the stilling of the mind, through finding very powerful and strong internal bliss, you can find that point where that craving is actually satisfied, where the craving stops. But it is in a completely different place than where you thought it was. It wasn't by following the craving and actually trying to satisfy it. It was by giving it up, by finding a different kind of happiness, the spiritual kind of happiness. And then you go into a state of samadhi that is very profound. All the craving is gone. You feel the highest bliss that you have ever experienced in your life. And you realize, wow, I have found the thing that I was always looking for. I found the thing that craving was promising would, uh, you know, the craving was promising, if you get this, then you will be happy. I have actually found it, uh, but I had to go a different direction. Uh, so don't be a white sheep. If you are a white sheep, if you follow what everyone else does in the world, you can have exactly life like everyone else. Uh, yeah? And that is not really worthwhile. Most people are not really all that satisfied in life. They die, the craving is still strong, they are not really found that satisfaction they are looking for. So be a black sheep, or be a, gr a pink sheep. Have you heard about the pink sheep? 
Pink sheep, okay, they are really cool, right? Because the black, black doesn't sound so good, right? Black sheep sounds a bit bad. So apparently there was an artist in Iceland who painted pink sheep, yeah? And so this artist, well, well, how come you paint pink sheep? Because being a white sheep is kind of bad. It's following the crowd. These are pink. They think for themselves, right? So pink sheep is the new black sheep. So be a pink sheep, right? Or be a, uh, be a, I don't know, you can be a red, you have a nice red kind of uh, t-shirt, so you can be the red sheep, maybe, or whatever it is. Uh. So this is how we kind of start to reevaluate life, yeah? Don't be afraid of thinking for yourself. Uh, don't be afraid of doing things differently. I am very glad that I, when I decided to become a monk, that I was very stubborn. My parents did not want me to become a monk. I know that people here in Malaysia think that it is only in the Chinese culture that, you know, the parents do not want the children to become a monk, yeah? Don't become a monk, become a lawyer, doctor, make the family proud, right? That's kind of the idea. It actually is universal. It's not just Chinese culture, it's culture across the board. Maybe it's a little bit stronger in Chinese culture, actually it's everywhere. Yeah. And uh, so uh, sometimes you have to be stubborn and say, sorry, mum and dad, but this is what I want to do. Please give me permission. And of course, they give you permission. And they think it's just a stage, and then they kind of come back again afterwards. Uh, unfortunately, they got that wrong. Yeah. But uh, <laughs> Anyway, I think uh, we have... Uh, spent all the time. So, uh, wonderful to see you all again. And I wish you all the very best in your practice. May you have wonderful success and everything. And uh, maybe we will meet again sometime in the future.